Hey co-orders, it's David. When we look at the configurations of distant planetary systems, are they the outcome of a purely random process? Or are they the product of some common set of rules? A playbook of planet formation, if you will. And if so, how much information do these planetary systems contain? In short, do planetary systems remember how they formed? These are the kind of questions that I've been musing over for the last year now, and I'm happy to reveal that my new paper on the subject has been accepted for publication, and I wanted to tell you about it here on this channel. The kinds of questions I'm alluding to here, questions of information content and randomness, lend themselves to a type of mathematical analysis known as information theory. It was Claude Shannon in the late 1940s who really kick-started this whole field when he started thinking about the information content of language and communication, off the back of his work in cryptography during the Second World War. These days, information theory has seen a wide number of uses, everything from signal processing to data compression, even in the study of black holes. But the application of information theory to exoplanets is somewhat terra incognito. Maybe that's how I got into this, because personally I always enjoy working on projects which are hopefully breaking new ground and are a bit more off the wall than usual. My whole inspiration for this project came from looking at the multiple planetary systems being discovered by Kepler, such as Kepler 82, which I'm going to represent with some Play-Doh here. Kepler-82 is a four-planet system where the planets appear to get bigger the further away you are from the star. Other times you get systems like Kepler-106, where the size ordering goes from small to large, small to large. And when you compare these two different configurations, it seems natural to claim that Kepler-106 here appears disordered, whereas Kepler-82 appears highly ordered. But why do we think this, and can we quantify such a statement? Well, in information theory, we can quantify disorder using a concept known as entropy. A simple example of entropy is to think about building a sandcastle in a sand pit. If I randomly move the sand around or the wind just sort of randomly blows it around, it's not very likely that it's going to create a sandcastle right in front of me. That's a very ordered state. There are far more ways to rearrange the sand particles into something like this, a flat homogeneous mess, than there is a sandcastle. So if we forcibly rearrange the sand into a sandcastle shape, then we're in a very special condition, since only a very small subset of all of the possible ways I could rearrange the sand would resemble something like this, a sandcastle. Entropy quantifies this idea of disorder by asking how many ways are there of rearranging the sand and achieving something which looks more or less the same which we would call a microstate. In the case of a sandcastle, there are very few arrangements. But in the case of a homogeneous flat sand pit, well, there are a lot. In the same way, I wondered if we could quantify the entropy for the size ordering of planetary systems. So let's take our friend Kepler-82 shown here again. This is our sandcastle, a perfectly ordered low entropy state. Now, if I swap any two of these planets around, I'm going to break that perfect ordering and thus increase the entropy. So let's try defining a microstate by a tally score. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say if the next planet along in a sequence is larger, I'm going to increase the tally by plus one. If the next planet along in the sequence is smaller, I'm going to decrease the tally by minus one. And thus I can add up all the tallies and get a final tally score. So here it would be zero. Now in the case of Kepler-82, which is perfectly ordered, I go plus one, plus one, plus one, so I get a final tally score of plus three. Now actually, no matter how many ways I try to you know, rearrange these planets or swap them around, I can only ever get plus three with one arrangement, and that's like this. So this is the state of Kepler-82, and thus it lives in a very ordered low entropy configuration. Now let's take our friend Kepler-106 again, where the size ordering goes from small to large, small to large, giving us a tally of plus one, to minus one to plus one, therefore a total of plus one. Now there are actually 11 different ways that I can swap these planets around and arrive at the same score. Allow me to demonstrate.
So there you have it. And in information theory, we define the entropy as the logarithm of the number of ways we can rearrange the components of this system and get the same microstate, which is a tally of plus one. So we have 11 different ways of achieving that, and log base two of 11 is 3.46 bits. Yes, bits is in the same unit your computer uses to store information. Okay, great, so we have a way to define the entropy of a planetary system, but when we apply it to the solar system, we get kind of a weird result. Let's consider a fairly idealized case where I'll replace Mars with a super Earth. And that's actually what would have happened had Jupiter not migrated in so much during the early years of the solar system. So in this idealized case, things seem fine at first. The tally gradually increases all the way up to Jupiter. But then it suddenly reverses all the way back down again. This up and down staircase leads to a net tally of plus one, which actually has a whopping 15,619 ways of achieving. That's the highest possible. So something's not right here because my model is predicting that even an idealized solar system has the highest amount of disorder possible. And clearly when you look at the solar system, there is some localized size ordering happening. So to fix this, my paper introduces a modification to how we define a microstate, such that it's not just defined purely by the tally score, but also the history of that tally score with respect to planet rank. So this gray area is actually maximized by having a staircase like that of the idealized solar system. And thus the solar system now becomes a relatively unusual state again, and therefore a low entropy system. Great. But on the downside, introducing this modification does make the mathematics behind the scenes a bit more tricky. Using the simple tally scoring system, this is the pyramid of microstates possible, where the red numbers there define the tally scores, and the black numbers are the number of ways of getting each microstate represented by each box. Now those black numbers actually follow a well-known number sequence called the Eulerian numbers. Okay, great, that's really helpful. But when we introduce this modification to the entropy system, each row of microstates now gets split into a 2D plane, as you can see here for the case of a six planet system. And now the number of unique microstates grows from N, the number of planets, up to this special and hilariously named number called the cake number. That's actually defined as the maximum number of pieces which I can get from slicing a cake n times. So, for example, if I've made zero slices, then there's just one piece, one giant piece of cake. But if I make n equals one slice, and I'm gonna do it in a kind of a strange direction, like this, I have now two pieces of cake. Let's hope this thing sticks together. If I make a second slice, now in this direction over here, I now have four pieces of cake, and finally, twisting it another 60 degrees, I make a third slice over here, and I now have eight pieces of cake. Delicious. Mm. As you can see here, I did a lot of research to verify this hypothesis. I mean, this is science. I didn't want to do it, it's just part of my job. And you know, after much experimentation, I can confirm that cake is delicious. But that's just the total number of microstates possible. The actual occupancy of each of these unique microstates gets even trickier and no longer follows that Eulerian number sequence I described before. In fact, I was unable to find any analytic formula or well-known number sequence which could generate the microstate occupancies that I saw. So here's an open challenge to you guys. I'm going to put all of my visualizations of the microstates, their occupancies, up online in a link below. If any of you are able to spot a pattern, a recursive formula which can predict these numbers, then hey, you can actually help us to calculate planetary entropies in the future. So definitely check that out if you're interested. In my paper, I just kind of brute force calculated the occupancy of each of these microstates. I then saved it into a file, and now I can go and look at real data and just look at this file whenever I wanna know what the occupancies are. So applying my entropy method to the real catalog of exoplanets, shows that the architectures of the planets that we have detected are definitively not random. They are the product of one or more preferential ways of making planetary systems. And indeed, they contain a finite volume of information about those mechanisms. Now, it might sound kind of obvious and completely intuitive to say that the exoplanets we've detected contain some level of information, 
But hopefully this analysis shows that it was actually surprisingly difficult to prove that in a rigorous framework. But this result is actually not necessarily expected because even if planetary systems are born in an initially pristine, highly ordered state, they don't stay that way forever. They change and they evolve. Planets can swap positions, they can get ejected from the system, they can crash into each other or into the star. For example, even the solar system is chaotic and might become unstable on a few billion years timescale. Planetary entropy, just like entropy in other contexts, can only increase with respect to time. Just like a sandcastle which is exposed to the elements, it will eventually crumble and return to a state of pure randomness. In this way, we can now say that the planetary systems we have detected more closely resemble the sandcastle case than the messed up sand pit. And yes, they've eroded a little and taken a few knocks, but we can still see the outline of these planetary sandcastles. In other words, yes, planets do remember something of their younger years. So that's my new paper. I hope you enjoyed hearing about it here in this video. And if you want to read more about it, I'll put the link down below so you can get the paper online as well. Thank you so much for watching this video and especially to all of you who've subscribed to the channel so far. We have lots of cutting edge, exciting new research coming out of our group in the near future. So make sure you stay tuned on here to hear about it first on this channel. As always, if you have any questions about entropy or planetary entropy, then be sure to put them down below in the comment section. I'll be sure to get back to you. And until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious. In fact, there may be a need for further expert Cake is delicious. And in fact, the main way... <laughs> We're not a cake. <laughs>